Okay, you're in for a real treat this morning. Uh, we had a great leadoff hitter last night, and Chief, thanks for joining us again this morning. He's letting uh, the number two batter come up next, and uh, certainly number two in our program, but number one in our hearts, because he's the 17th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant James Cody. Now, he's, he's all ready to go. I will tell you that obviously his position, he's there to give advice to the chief and to the secretary, and he works with the other services, but he's really there for all of you. He represents you, he takes your opinions and your thoughts and brings them back to the chief and secretary. And for us here in the mobility audience, we kind of like to think he's one of ours because he spent so much time in Air Mobility Command. He was the uh, command chief right down the road here at MacDill Air Force Base in the 6th Air Mobility Wing. He was the command chief at 15th Mobility, what do we call it at the time, Expeditionary Task Force. And he was the command chief at 18th Air Force. So he spent a lot of time in the mobility business. So please, let's give him a great mobility welcome, Chief Cody. Thank you, and good morning. Boss, thanks for being here. Thanks for kind of leading off, and thanks for at least giving me almost 12 hours between having to speak after you. That's helpful. You know, two or three days is usually better, but uh, I do appreciate the span of distance between following you. Um, uh, General Light, uh, Chief Reynolds, thanks, thanks for this continued relationship the ATA has with our Air Force. This is huge. The partnership with industry and what we continue to do is a big deal. So, so thanks for doing that. Thanks for continuing to work hard to create this venue where we can bring our airmen together, talk about what we do, uh, think about what we need to be able to do into the future, and then take an opportunity to develop some of our great airmen. It was really kind of neat to see how many people are coming to this for the first time. And certainly to all the other leaders, General Everhart, Chief Gamble, thanks for your leadership, not only in AMC, but in our Air Force. There's a lot going on, and, and you're leading the way in that, so I really can't thank you enough. And I just love the theme of this uh, conference, because this is what I love to do. Anybody that's had the opportunity to hear me speak, I apologize, but you'll have to bear through it one more time today. But this idea of talking about airmen and excellence in action is what I love to do more than anything. Uh, it is actually the best part of being the Chief Master in the Air Force, is getting to talk about our airmen. And... Uh, so uh, I want to leave a little bit of time uh, for questions, so I'm, I'm going to say it up front just so you have time to think about what you want your question to be at the, at the end. Um, but, I, but I really uh, want to kind of talk about a few of our air mobility airmen and a few of our airmen across the Air Force that really personify this idea of excellence in action. Uh, and first, this is what I'll tell you. As we travel around, and General West Wells can attest to this, all the senior leaders can attest to this that have the opportunity to travel and spend time with our airmen is they're proud. Uh, they're really proud of what they do. You see it on their face the minute you walk up to them. Then you get to talk to them. And then you really start to understand how proud they are. And really what that puts that all into the meaning that means everything to us and the American people and our partners globally is what they do and how well they do it. You know they're proud in what they do. So I could go on and on about this all day, but let me give you a few examples of some airmen that uh, you know or you should know, some of you in this room know. They're, they're pretty phenomenal. Uh, and I was actually even just talking uh, to General Welsh yesterday about Senior Reverend Crystal Cash. So she's 22 years old. Now, phenomenal airman. And that picture is her in the back end of a KC-135, so about two and a half times her age, right? Uh, so really puts the meaning of those pictures that the boss had up there yesterday when you think about it. And uh, you, you think about this. Three years in our Air Force, she has more than 700 hours and the back end of a KC-135. So she's one of the first airmen that went back into Iraq for us as things have shifted yet again, and we've had to have a presence in there. She's just amazing, just an amazing airman. And you know what's really amazing with you when you ask her, and I'll paraphrase her quote because it's kind of long, but it's when you ask her about what she does, you know, what, how she kind of articulates what she does, she says it's like trying to get somebody to the hospital and save their lives and you're running out of gas, and the gas station is closed. They may or may not make it. She says, we're that station, ready to give every last bit of fuel that they need. Because there's no pulling over up here. And every ounce of fuel that we give 
the seconds that lives can be saved. That's an airman that understands what she does and the importance of what she does for America. Pretty awesome. And over there on the right-hand uh, slide, that's Tech Sergeant Rebecca Martin. She's uh, actually a uh, aircrew flight equipment NCO, just got down to Pope Army Airfield for us. She came over from... Uh, England recently, but I had the great opportunity to meet her up in the office. She was just recently up in the Pentagon because she was being honored with the DOD Spirit of Hope Award. So she's really good at her job. There's just no question about it and really proud of it. But I got to meet her. I got to meet her dad and her sister. And they all came in and, you know, we got to celebrate what she does. And so well beyond the fact that she's a wife, has three kids, is trying to go to school, and she's really, really good at her job, she volunteers a lot to make a difference in other people's lives. Not because she thinks it's going to get her promoted. Not because she thinks she somehow has to do it to impress somebody. She does it to give back because she feels she's been given so much. And this is the only way she knows how to do it. She gives a lot in her job. For all of us, that would probably be more than enough. But she's compelled to do more. And obviously enough, we saw that at a department level that we recognize her with this award. But what a tremendous... Her dad was so proud he stood about this tall. So she's not real tall and he's not... She's taller than him. She, but proud, you want to talk about a proud dad that just never stopped smiling the entire time he was in the office. It was just amazing. You know, that's excellence. That's us. That's our family. And then here is Staff Sergeant Hadea Star Eagle. Now, a name like Star Eagle, that's going to be awesome just to begin with, right? How, how can you, you're destined for, for some level of greatness without question. And you know what's, what's great about Hadea is... Uh, Actually, Athena met her first when we were out doing a base visit at Scott. Actually, a little over a year ago, uh, we, we met her when we were doing a base visit. And Athena was off on part of her itinerary, and she was over talking with some of the folks in some of the programs, and they have this single airman's program initiative out there at Scott. And, uh, you know, Hadea talked with Athena about how excited she was about this program. She got to Scott, you know, uh, you either like Illinois or you don't. You know, it's kind of one of those things that either grows on you or the corn grows on you, something. But you got to, you know, you got to really want to be there. And that wasn't really her thing. I mean, she got there. She started to hunker down into the dorms. She was still an airman living in the dorms at that time. And it was really this program that pulled her out and got her reconnected with her Air Force. And she was excited about it because it completely changed her mind about how this experience was going to be and how important her job was working in a command post and how she really needed to connect with her fellow airmen. And there was actually a lot to do in that area and a lot to learn about it. And why I really like to tell uh, Hadea's story is because recently we just established this program. It's called the Senior Leader Enlisted Commissioning Program, where we can, uh, the senior leaders of our Air Force have this opportunity to kind of reach down and say, you know what, we got an airman that's a really a proven performer here, doing great things, has potential beyond how we're using them today. And we're able to put them right into officer training school. So not the normal process, the hand on the shoulder, hey, congratulations, you've been selected. Because you've shown us not just the fact that she went out on her own and got her education, but she showed us she's the type of person that can lead in our Air Force and we need as a leader. So I had the real honor of calling her just about a week and a half ago and telling her that I selected her for that program. And she'll start it the first of the year. So pretty amazing young lady that's going to continue to go on yet. Yeah. It, it, it was one of the most special moments I've ever had hearing how excited she was on the phone about this and how I promise you she'll give back for the rest of her life. She'll make us proud. No question about it. But hey, let me have a couple of our airmen tell you how proud they are of what they do. <laughs> We are constantly playing a game of Tetris. The more you put on our plane, the bigger the game of Tetris it is. You know, when you have a few things of cargo, it's like, oh, you know, we can, we can easily move this over here, move this over there. But it's when you start putting 18-wheeler trucks and pallets and helicopters, it becomes even more of a game of Tetris in that it's like you don't have much room to play. That's when it teaches you to be a real loadmaster. A loadmaster is the technical expert for cargo loading operations on a particular airframe. Sweet, thanks man. Yes, sir. Uh, just like I'm the loadmaster, I'm the expert on the C5. Within the, the cargo loading, uh, we're responsible for making sure that the cargo doesn't exceed aircraft limits as well as uh, passenger loading operations. 
Flight 87-0035. We're responsible for uh, the upload and download of passengers. We go over all of the safety and emergency uh, procedures that pertain to the C5, uh, and we're responsible for making sure the safety and comfort of passengers are met uh, all the way through the time we uh, pick them up to the time that we drop them off at the, whatever location we're going to. Although the work is hard, it's pretty rewarding to be able to you know, wake up in Dover and fly halfway across the world to support anything that's going on at any given time. I'm telling you right now, if someone offered me a job beside a Loadmaster, I'd say I'm sorry, but no. To see the world and to get my hands dirty, it describes me. So I don't think anything says it better than that. You know, a couple of great airmen talking about how proud they are of what they do and understand what they do. So, you know, you have these great proud airmen, and what really I think Air Mobility Command does as good as anybody, maybe better than most, is you really great, resilient airmen. You, you are focused on this. You have been focused on this for quite some time. Certainly a leading effort in our Air Force of how we can kind of promulgate this across our entire enterprise. And, you know, we talk a lot about individual resiliency. We talk about group resiliency. I want to tell you a little bit about, you know, some team resiliency. And I, I really thought it was good. This is a unit that has been getting it done for a long time for us, deploying out of Charleston, really, really making a difference. And what I thought was interesting when we were talking with this team and, and hearing about their story is, you know, we had them earlier in the year, and we're doing the retrograde. They're, they're moving a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that people thought we would never really be able to get done in the time frame that we did. But... You know, when this machine comes together and our airmen come together, we get some pretty phenomenal things done. And here they are. This is actually a picture of them in Afghanistan doing the retrograde. Really, you know, they're loading some stuff up. But what's interesting about this and what sometimes we don't talk about in the resiliency, so they're going. They've been on these deployments before. Family knows what's going on. They know the mission. You know, some of this stuff becomes pretty, pretty routine for these folks because we've been doing it so long. But in the middle of this mission specifically, they got, uh, you know, redirected. And instead of retrograding, they ended up finding themselves going into Iraq and actually opening airfields and moving stuff in. And while somebody would say, hey, that's no big deal, that kind of stuff happens, you know, we, we remission people all the time. And certainly in this command, we remission people all the time. But you don't, when you think about this, this is a little bit different when you're talking about, okay, we kind of said we're done in Iraq, right? We're, we're not doing this thing anymore, and we're trying to be done in Afghanistan. Afghanistan from a large foot presence. So these folks are talking with their families every night. They've got their heads wrapped around one mission, right? Getting out of Dodge. And then all of a sudden, no, we're going back into Dodge uh, in a different way. And to really adjust like that takes some significant resiliency, not only by these great airmen to re-team up and refocus, but by their families that they're calling up at night and saying, hey, we, you know, we're not on schedule with that anymore. We're actually doing something different. And to do that creates a, you know, a level of preparation this idea of resiliency and their ability to adapt and then go get the job done and do it in the way that they did. And we do it unlike anybody else in the world. And this is a phenomenal team. Like I said, they've been in it a lot, but all of a sudden when you sit there and say you think you're going here and all of a sudden you're going here, it really does take a shift and then you have to somehow get yourself focused on it and they did it in a phenomenal way. So that's the kind of team resiliency thing that I think sometimes we don't give enough credit for is when we come together as a team and we have to do these things, we're actually really, really good at it and we should acknowledge it. But let me tell you a little bit about some personal re resiliency. So I hope a lot of you in here know about Captain Christy Wise. I know the boss has talked about it before. I just talked to her 45 minutes ago uh, on the phone before I came down to talk to you because I wanted to chat with her. She just finished the Army 10-miler, and she'd been working on doing this. And you know the thing about it when you talk to Captain Wise, if any of you have talked to it, you know, so the minute you thought you were working hard, talk to Captain Wise, and then you realize, man, I have been doing nothing and I need to step up my game a little bit. Because what she is doing and what she's accomplishing, just to give uh, the entire audience a little bit of background on it, Captain Wise, C-130 pilot, back in April was down in the panhandle with her boyfriend. They were doing some paddle boarding in the evening, something they've done many times before in a protected cove, had lights on to be out there doing it. And uh, unfortunate accident, basically a boater out there, you know, she tried to wave him off and stuff, basically came right at it, never deviated. She ended up having a dive in the water. Uh, she really says, by the grace of God, she's alive. She pushed off the bottom of that boat uh, just at the right moment before it would have just, come, you know, run her directly over. But tragically, she did lose her leg in this uh, accident. Uh, and um, 
you know, that's, that's a tough thing for a young lady, tough thing for uh, an airman. But uh, now the real story starts and we get to know uh, about the Christie Wise. It was always there, but we just never really appreciated it in the way that we probably should have. And Captain Wise, this is really uh, just nine weeks after uh, that incident. She's down there doing the Warrior Games, bringing home medals. Uh, pretty, pretty phenomenal, uh, inspirational airman. And I'm telling you, that officer is dedicated to getting back in that cockpit. She's actually working with her, uh, her prosthetist person today to try to work some things out. She's been working in the simulator to try to get back in there to figure out how she's going to you know, operate the aircraft uh, with her prosthetic. And I'm confident she's going to get there. But this is, so, you know, what, Christy, what, what Captain Wise and I talked about this morning wasn't about all those nice smiles and everything like that. Because that's pretty inspirational, isn't it? You look at that and you say, I'm not worthy. I mean, you know, I complain about stuff and what am I complaining about? Uh, what I really want to do is I recently read her blog after the Army 10 Miler. She did a little blog on the flight home. And this told the real story. So this is the story everybody wants to be motivated and inspired by, right? Because this just makes you, it's uplifting to say, hey, after a tragic thing, she's overcoming it. She's, she's persevering. She's going to be successful. But let me tell you, she's doing that for us. There's a lot more going on for Captain Wise than what you see in this picture. And she talked about it on that flight home after that 10 miler. And what resiliency really means is, is you're never going to get there or anywhere without the help, support, and love of other people. And that's what she talked about. She wouldn't have made it through that Army 10 miler. She'll tell you right now, it wasn't going to happen. Almost, almost a mile and a half into it, she was like, not, not for me. And, and she's been working hard because, as you can expect, she's you know, still trying to get used to her prosthetic. She damaged her good leg and her toe, which exasperated the problem, right? So now her good leg isn't as good as it needed to be. So all these things working against her, and it was the team of people that did this 10 miler with her that continued to uplift her. And it really made them better. It made them better, and it helped push her along. But what I want you to take away from this, and this is what Captain Wise and I talked about, is none of this stuff is easy. This is hard, and it's hard for her every single day. But she gets up and does it every single day. And there's a lot going on in the back end beyond those smiles. It's an incredible airman being supported by other incredible airmen and friends and family. And we shouldn't forget that. This stuff is hard. It takes a toll. And we shouldn't, you know, this is the one thing I wanted to remind her, I says, is we're so proud of you, but don't think we've got you up so high on a pedestal that we don't expect that this is hard. And everything's not going to be a smile and everything's not going to be success, but we're here with you either way. So really an inspirational airman, a phenomenal young lady. So really proud of her. So, you know, you take proud airmen, got great resilient airmen, and now you talk about the innovation of our airmen and, and how you think of all those things that the boss described and how we've evolved, right? It would be a pretty amazing thing if we were trying to throw gas cans to each other with a hook today, right, and do what we do. Uh, and uh, we get to see this. This is, you know, the great thing is because we've kind of reinvigorated talking about innovation in our Air Force. We've always had it, but we're really talking about it and trying to leverage it in ways that we never did before. We get to see this a lot when we're out on the road. So you can go downstairs in the exhibit, and you can see this transportation isolation system. I got to walk through that yesterday. So here we go from basically what I would describe we had to transport people. It was, was kind of like a sleeping bag in a plastic bag is what it looked like. I mean, that's how we would transport people that had an infectious disease like this. And typically, policy was don't transport them. But if you had to, that's kind of what we had. Couldn't get, you couldn't have health care providers around them. They were kind of in this thing. You know, uh, I would arguably say next best, you know, you're, not, you're, you're looking at something that really has a similarity to a body bag that you can look into. I mean, that's kind of what I would describe it as, uh, is what we had. That's not nice, but that's, if you go down and look at it, that's what it looks like. Now you have a unit that in 60 days we brought our transcom team, our AMC airmen together, all of them, every single one of them, anybody that touches that aircraft. And now we have a unit that we can transport multiple pilots on. We put it on the back of a C-17 and we're saving lives. And we're getting them home where we can provide them the care that we need to. This is pretty amazing on what we do when we have to step up to the plate. Really great. This pit, this is parts inspection turnover process. This is a great young airman. Uh, Staff Sergeant Chad Eckerson down at Dover. He's a, a, a non-destructive uh, inspection um, uh, airman. He works in that, that lab, the inspection lab. And, you know, anybody that knows this stuff, it's a little complicated, but I will explain it to you in the way that I had to remember it, so well be below the level of which he understands. But basically, 
you know, every time we work on an airplane, any time we do any, you know, the, the, the equipment that works on an airplane, they have to have all these forms and stuff that they document it. So anytime you change something, there's all these forms you fill out and they're just, they kind of, different forms for different things. But it all goes into this inspection process. He developed a database that takes all of that and puts it all together. So you can just sit in front of the screen immediately, either be a job number, be a stock number or whatnot, figure out what's happened, do the query, and really just brought this thing up to where it probably should have been a long time ago. It almost, always almost amazes me, right, that where we are today, and so this airman just did this, you know, because we've had a lot of smart airmen. That you would have thought, okay, but we do have airmen every day that are constantly thinking about this stuff. They're doing it at Osan now. We've got four other bases that are going to do it. This is the kind of airmen. When you talk about the present, that's the present, and you talk about the future, that's the future right there, airmen like that. You know, we got an airman there. You see that KC-135 pulley. You know, we ran into it because we've been flying that aircraft forever, so imagine things breaking it, right? There's a pulley in the back of that thing that the cable goes up and on, so the boom will come up and down a lot. Of, you know, again, that's layman's terms, not your technical terms, right? Uh, and the essence of this thing is, uh, you know, nobody builds that airplane anymore. Nobody in the world flies it but really us, to be honest. And uh, that pulley started fatigue, but the uh, subcontractor uh, for the prime contractor, you know, stopped making those things a long time ago. There's no money in it. Um, so all of a sudden they start breaking and we need to replace them, and we can't. So we had to work. Uh, with the prime contractor, and they gave us the specs on it, and our airmen, so that's a $10,000 part if we buy it, right? If we buy it through, you know, somebody that makes it for us, $10,000. It costs us less than $1,000 for those airmen to make it. That's our airmen. That takes a weapon system and puts it back into the fight in a day versus months to get a new contractor to start bringing this stuff up and to have somebody inspect it to say we can use it, you know, it's... It's pretty amazing what they do. And then uh, they're doing some great sh stuff with this crew chief university also, which is really a way that, you know, Chief Gamble focuses on this and the command we focus on at the Air Force. This idea of continued development of our force, how we look at ourselves as professionals and how you have to continue to educate and learn to raise the bar. And that's what they're doing. They're taking senior eminent staff sergeants out off the line and bringing them back into this environment and really reconnecting them with the mission at large and the importance of having the level of technical competency we have but also understanding the greater picture. This is just you know innovative ways to continue to elevate our force to be able to do what we have to do today but we don't even know what we're going to need to do in the future. And you need airmen like this to get it done. Let me, let me show this video that kind of talks about what our airmen get done for us every day and how kind of innovative they have to be. Between the maintainer and the airplane, this is not our natural habitat. We are all about the elements, in the cold, in the heat. We live and we die out on the flight line. When I first heard the symptoms of this aircraft, I uh, immediately knew what, what the issue had been. So I was the first one out there to pull the panels off. And when we first got a, a real uh, look at the damage, it was pretty, uh, it, it took us back quite a bit. As soon as we dropped one of the panels, we actually had shrapnel fall out of it. And we stuck our heads up in there and saw about three feet of ducting that had been just blown apart. And that gave us the, the initial shock. And then after we got the leading edges off, uh, we saw that the, the duct had actually been completely blown apart. And everything in that area was, was completely destroyed. We replaced about 3,500 feet of wiring uh, along with a handful of uh, line replaceable units a lot of cannon plugs and jacks, but yeah, everything in that area was, was replaced. The most rewarding is obviously being a part of something so big. We've never done any, any kind of maintenance like that. As long as I've been in the Air Force, we've never done anything that big. Just to see the aircraft go from grounded to pieces to airworthy within couple months, stuff that we don't do ever. It's pretty rewarding and exciting, especially as a dedicated crew chief. This isn't the, kind of the type of thing that we normally do. This is normally accomplished by a, a depot team. So having to step back and not have a book to tell you how to do things, have to, have to use a little brain power to, to put things into action was difficult, it was exciting. It was pretty cool to be able to step back and and reassess the way that you do things and kind of rewrite the book as you go. Spending every minute of every day with this aircraft for the last two months has really allowed me to 
to see the little nits and pieces that I didn't see before that now. So yeah, it does, it does bring you closer to the aircraft. It makes you actually care about it more. I mean, you, you've invested so much time in it, now it becomes your baby. That's got to make you feel good about being an airman. It just does. You know, little things like we live and die on the flight line, and that airplane is your baby. I mean, that's that's the character. That's that's the that's the soul of the people that do our business. It's pretty pretty awesome. You know, so you got these great, proud airmen, resilient, innovative, and you got this is the kind of stuff that this command just doing in this last year is, you know, a billion pounds of fuel nearly 100,000 passengers, 5,000 patients, you know, uh, and it goes on and on and on. Um, it's just really amazing what you're doing. And this isn't just for America. This is for our partners globally. This makes a difference in people's lives that you can't even probably imagine. And the way you stay focused on it is just remarkable, given the fact that, you know, nothing stops, right? All this other stuff still goes on. You know, this is what really, really kind of, I think, amazes General Welsh and I on any given day of how, you do the job, you're getting it done, nothing stops, but yet the force has to continue to move forward. And all this stuff that you see on there is happening. It's all evolving, it's all going in the directions that it needs to for you know an organization like ours. For a world-class professional Air Force, you have to get after all of this stuff and you have to deal with reality every given day. And it's really, really amazing what our airmen do to get it done and their families do to support them. But here's what I'll tell you, none of this stuff could happen. All that great stuff you saw in, 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 the, in the first part of the presentation, this right here, none of it happens. It ha you got to have these great airmen, but if you don't have leadership, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't. You have a lot of great people with a lot of great intentions, but you need leadership. And I really want to kind of pick up where the boss started uh, yesterday, and I want to talk about uh, and show you a little something about one of your leaders that I think is really appropriate. So, Chief, uh, you know, uh, we're the Air Force uh, we are today because we've had you, and we can't thank you enough. But even moreover, our airmen are better because of you, because you put your heart and soul into this, and I can't thank you enough for everything you've done for our Air Force and all of us. Thanks. All right, I think I have a little bit of time left, maybe, yeah. for some questions. So if we could bring the house lights up, please, and uh, get the microphones down the aisle, and, and, and even if...
before we can get a microphone to you, if you could just stand up so that the microphone folks know where you're at or raise your hand. Don't be shy. Don't make me call the Pope. <laughs> All right, we've got one right down here in the center, guy. Thanks. Morning, Chief. My Morning. name is Staff Sergeant Dustin Robb, 62nd OSS, McCord Field. Uh, I was wondering, from your perspective, the shift to the DSD for special duties, do you feel as though we've filled those positions with people that are more professional and better qualified and better apt for those positions as a result? Or do you feel as though the volunteer program we had maybe served a little bit better than what we have now? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, I think I wouldn't really characterize it the same way you did, but I'll certainly try to get after your question. So um, one, let me kind of cover down on the volunteer part first. Everybody in here volunteer? Right hand? Yeah? Okay, everybody's a volunteer, got that covered, right? Uh, we, all, we all decided to serve, so we're in this. This is really about, and goes to everything that we're trying to kind of evolve to, and that's deliberate development of the force. This is about the right person at the right time in their career with the right skill sets to do what their Air Force needs them to do. So I understand individual airmen have desires to do things at given points in their lives, maybe even given points in their careers for different things. And we would and will support that when we can, if it aligns up with the right airmen at the right time. So understanding that you want to do one of those DSDs is really important to us, a conversation you should be having with your supervisor. And if they're not able to support you, they owe you the feedback to say, why aren't they supporting you? Because we've given a pretty broad window where an airman has an opportunity to go into those 10 developmental special duties. Really, Staff Sergeant, Tech Sergeant, Master Sergeant. That is a big window of an enlisted person's career. And they have two opportunities a year to be considered for that opportunity. So that you can, volunteer, you can let your desire and intentions be known to your supervisor and leadership. And if they feel you're the right airman to do that job at the right time for Air Force, then they're going to nominate you. And then given that span of time, you have a really good chance of being selected. But if you're not the right airman at the right time, if you need to be focused on your, your primary AFSC, if you need to be where you're at, then that's a fair conversation to have with you also. So here's what I will tell you. Based on the feedback that we have from all the commands that own these primarily Air Education Training Command, but they do span into the others, there is a much higher level of confidence that we are putting the right people in at the right time in their careers to do these jobs. That's where the confidence level is, and that's what really we were trying to achieve. So it isn't this idea that we don't want people to let us know what they want to do. But maybe we need to work on that vernacular of volunteerism. I, I know you're a volunteer. You're here. It's just now us having the conversation of where you belong. Sound fair? Thanks. Right down here in the front, guys, please. Hey, Chaplain. How you doing? Good morning. Hang on just a second, Chaplain. It's coming. I'm not sure you'll get all the way to the back, but that is a great voice, Chaplain. Chief, we were talking last night and I really appreciated your insights. So one of the things that I really liked was your leadership through the changes. And that was one of the little statements here, I think. Um, would you amplify that a little bit? Because sure. attitude is so much of what we do. Sure. Uh, so the chaplain and I had a great conversation last night about, you know, all that stuff that was up on that slide, all that change that's going on. And, you know, the impact that that has on all of us, all of you. And it's a fair conversation to have because it's not insignificant. It creates a lot of anxiety, right? There's some uncertainty associated with it. Um, and, you know, to talk through that and kind of make sure we're in the same place and keeping each other informed is really important. And that's extremely challenging. And that's kind of what the chaplain and I talked about. You know, the level of effort that every leader in our Air Force, you know, puts towards trying to communicate what we're doing and why we're doing it uh, is not insignificant. But it's, on any given moment, completely ineffective. Right? We have to acknowledge the fact that despite our best efforts sometimes to communicate why and what we're doing and the challenges that we might be facing along the way, that doesn't get down to each and every one of you in a way that you can say, okay, I got it and I can work through it. And we try to use every medium that we can to get out there. We try to kind of communicate in different venues to kind of have that populate. But even with that best effort, we miss the mark sometimes. So it's important that we get called out on it. You know, it is important to say, hey, you know, I, I don't know what they're doing. So, you could sit there and say, hey, every one of these things is met with some challenges. And I would completely agree with you. Almost everything that we've tried to execute during our tenures has met with some level of challenge. Uh, yeah, uh, what have we ever done that didn't meet with some level of challenge? So maybe we didn't really set the right expectation up front 
and, and the idea or communicate it down to the right level that says, hey, we're going to make contact and learn a lot of things as we go through and we'll make adjustments. But as long as we keep the force whole, as long as we don't hurt anybody in this process, that's part of the, that's the cost of change. I mean, change is going to be a little bit difficult sometimes. The systems that we think are going to work don't always work. They work with 1,000, they don't work with 10,000, you know, and, and, and you know, all these things happen, and none of that is an excuse, and that's what I tried to relate to Chapman. We're not making any excuses for the challenges we're facing. These are very deliberately approached things, but that doesn't mean they're going to execute perfectly, and we just have to be professional enough to have that conversation, take the feedback, make the adjustments or tell you why we can't make the adjustments and then move forward. And over time, this will become normal. Whatever it is that we're talking about will be normal and we'll get through it. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't be talking about it. But I will tell you what I shared with the Chiefs yesterday about this. I think it's fair we talk about it at every level that we need to to get everybody in the right place. But then I think it's really, really important that we move forward and we get back to that mission stuff. Because you can belabor this stuff to the point that you're not focused on anything but what might happen and what's going to happen and what hasn't happened yet. And nothing that we're doing stops when you're having that conversation. But our attention could. So I, I, I think it's fair that we continue to get that feedback. I think, I think we owe everybody the conversation. Specifics are always helpful. These aggregated things are difficult to respond to because, okay, what is the specific challenge? Let's walk you through that one. That doesn't mean there aren't lots of them, but we need to understand where we're missing the mark. But I, I really did appreciate your feedback uh, last night uh, on this and this idea that we have to continue to kind of reinforce, you know, make sure that we're, every decision we're making, we're not assuming that everybody understands why we made it or what iteration we're on of things. So I think that's a fair feedback and we have to continue to work on it. But I do ask people to kind of work through the emotional piece. That's the piece that you try to figure out how does it affect you, right? That's the piece that really comes to hit first. And then work through that piece and then let's talk about, okay, what are we doing as an Air Force? Why are we doing this? Why are we taking this approach? And then, you know, what do we need to adjust here? Thank you. Anyone else? Right here. Guys, again, down here in the front. Okay, here we go. Right to your uh, left, sir. Chief, good morning. Good morning, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Kyle Benowitz from the 321st Contingency Response Squadron at Joint Base McGuire. Awesome. Uh, we've gone through three separate of the senior NCO performance reporting systems now. I was wondering if you had any feedback as we move into the NCO performance reporting system. Sure. that will shape or information I can provide feedback to my NCOs as we move into this um, entire process. So you're asking when we're going to put the 910 out? I'm just trying to clear text it. You, you said it so eloquently, but I want to make sure I got it. <laughs> Absolutely not. So that I, I, some of the airmen are curious how, how it will affect. Is there things that they have learned about how the reports are being written, are they being, how are they yeah, received? Yeah, we're, at we're the actually boards? learning a lot. Maybe you can help me out with this. And again, I talked with the chiefs about this yesterday. So I will answer the nine ten thing since I teed it up there. Right, soon is the answer. Uh, uh, you can put whatever date on that, and somebody will be right. But uh, soon is what we're working on, and sooner than later uh, is even better. Uh, and the policy is in final chords and stuff like that. But you can understand the complexity associated with this. This is not a small thing. And even with all the effort and all the great people that are working on it, it's not going to be perfect. It just won't be. It'll meet contact with lots of airmen, and we'll get feedback that we'll make the tweaks and adjustment, and we'll just have to work through that. But uh, this is what I will ask you to do, and I really ask the chiefs to it. And, uh, and this came to a head just the other day for us. I'll share with you this example. And we have to, we have to really resist the urge to do this because it's a little bit in our nature. It's a little bit in like what like we always like to try to figure out a way to build the easy button. Right? So we get a new process, and now how do I build the easy button to that process? Right? We want to we kind of cut and dry some things that maybe aren't cut and dry. And this idea of a human capital, right? human resource, it is not cut and dry. This is about people, and you've got to know people to do it right. You can't just all of a sudden put everything into a checklist box item set up and say, you've done it, and I've got it right. You'll get it wrong almost every time if that's what you do. So what we've noticed, I got this uh, in feedback through social media. In itself, that happens a lot, but you know, we usually don't do widespread respond to the field based on one piece of input. But it was really exasperated by the fact that we were just out at three different bases. We were at Eglin, Herbert, and Barksdale, and I received the same exact feedback from Airmen there. So really this final kind of call was said, hey, we need to kind of make sure we give a little bit of direction to the field. So here, here's what I would ask you to do. The policy is coming. What policy we have determined is needed is in place right now. We're formulating a new policy. Don't create your own. 
If we didn't say we wanted you to do it, then we probably don't want you to do it, right? If we didn't say, come up with a checklist format by which you decide who's going to get to sign which EPR and which not EPR, don't do that because that's not what we're saying. That's an individual commander's decision. And it should be based on how they know their people and why they want to do that process, not this idea. And then what was really, really distressing to our airmen, I'm just giving you feedback from your airmen that you're leading, is this, this commentary that started to ensue where if, if this person, if an intermediate, let's just say an intermediate raider signed your report, then you could have no more than met expectations on your report. How ludicrous is that? That we would take the signature and then back it up and document the performance based on who signed the report. That is completely counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish here. You know, I, I, and I, it, we really need to be that blunt about it. Counterproductive. Performance is performance. They perform to the level based on the expectations that you set up for them, and if they, wherever they fall, they fall. And then wherever that report gets signed is appropriate to whatever the chain of command is and when they decide it needs to stop. Whether it makes it all the way up to the senior rater because they're getting stratification, whether it's a deputy, whether it's an immediate, that is a completely different process and it's just to say where we're going to stop the report. It doesn't mean that they didn't perform to whatever level they performed to. And we need to be real clear with that because we have, we have an opportunity here to kind of get right with some things that we've all been saying we needed to get right with. Know your people. Document their performance accurately and then when appropriate, discern amongst those that need to advance next. Get the order right of advancement. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. So I do ask, sir, for your help on that, where if you start, if people start creating little processes, unless we've detailed the process for you, that's probably something that should raise the hairs on the back of your head and say, what are we doing here? I'm okay. I think it's appropriate that you get people together and talk about your airmen so you make sure you know what people are doing. But when you start using checklists and say, well, if you didn't do this, you can't, you might have just missed the absolute best airmen we had. And there might have been a lot of reasons they didn't check that box this time that completely are, are, are the right reasons and we should be making the right decision about that airman. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. We really do need your help with this. We don't need to start we don't need to start unraveling it before we've unrolled it, you know, type of thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question. Please, if you've got one. I think in the back there, sir. Way back in the back on the on the audience's left. Morning, Chief. Morning. Chief Master Sergeant James Yarbrough, I'm at the 89th Airlift Support Group at Andrews Air Force Base. Great, Chief. One discussion that we've been having a lot uh, pertains to the 9-11, and something you said just a few minutes ago kind of uh, makes me reflect on that. <clears throat> With the new 9-11, we added in Master Sergeant Selects, okay? And we've been looking for it in the AFI, but we really haven't found it yet. How do you take a tech sergeant who has found out June, July time frame that they made E7, mm -hmm. most of them won't put it on by the end, of, by the closeout date, the static closeout date of the end of September. Mm -hmm. So what I would propose looking at that is it's very difficult to change the mindset and say, now we're going to rate this person as a senior NCO and line them up with everybody else who's already been a senior NCO for the whole year. Yeah. My argument is that the Air Force looked at them, looked at their records that year and said, you're the one based on what your tenure look back was and what you tested on WAPS, so you're promoted. You're also ineligible for senior master sergeant that cycle. And only a couple months from the, from the uh, release date to the static closeout date, what I propose is that on the 9-11 for master sergeant selects that we document all their performance so the bullets and everything would be filled out, but all the ratings would be non-rated for that year because my understanding is that the reason why you moved them to that form in the first place was to prevent three month and 15 month EPR closeouts, you know, and get in line with the static closeout date. So we do that and we say, you're promoted, congratulations. And it gives the supervisors a chance to give the initial, the midterm and the follow-up feedback as a senior NCO moving forward. Yeah, Chief, I, I think you bring up some good points and um we actually tried to walk through them when we kind of came up with this process for consistency, right, to get everybody lined up. So, so a couple things. So what they did before they got promoted uh, to Master Sergeant, you know, still within that reporting period, is their performance. So there are some things to be documented that we don't want to lose in that period of time. 
but we're not holding them. And, and again, the individual expectations for that airman aren't the same exact for, as the master sergeant that's been doing the job for two years. I mean, that's the difference. That's why you have individual feedback with folks, and based on where they're at, where they're coming into the organization, and what you're going to give them to do, their expectations should be a little bit different. And then they'll grow into it. And this is why they're in their by year, so they're not going to compete as, as an idea of, you know, okay, now I'm balancing all the records. They're not going to be considered for senior rater uh, stratification because they're not eligible. So it is just making sure we don't have a gap in period where we don't document the things that they've done over that, that, that time frame. So, you know, the fact is, is you'll document what they did, whatever that period that wasn't covered in the last EPR as performance, and then whatever period of time is left in that reporting period, whatever expectations were set up as soon as they sat down, you'll document to that. That could be small, large, it depends on where you, you know, to your point, how much time you have left. But again, we're spanning the same amount of time for everybody. But the only way to really line them up and not have it completely, you know, uh, disconnected from everybody else because of how we promote, you know, incrementally through the months, you got to kind of move everybody at the same time. That, that was the approach we took because we started out not doing that and it was a real problem for us. And that's why we immediately readjusted and said, hey, no, we've got to move the selects into the next group. So when they do get their first one eligible, they'll have already been synced up with that. It, you know, it's some of it's a bit of a management thing, but it's also a philosophy because if we do it the other way, then you go almost 23 months without people having a report. Uh, and we don't want that either. That's too, too long of a period of time. So, uh, you know, uh, here's what I'll tell you. Your feedback's important. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor this stuff as we fully implement. We go through a complete cycle of static closeout dates, a complete cycle of all this work, and, and we'll reassess that. Did, did that work in the way we thought it would, or did, did, do we need to tweak it in some different way? But, again, we're trying to keep every airman in the same place at the same time, trying to move everybody as the groups that they are. Thank you. Chief Cody, on behalf of General Light and the entire association, thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks.